Mark chapter 14, we, we're moving through the gospel of Mark, this, this idea of the gospel in action. Remember, we've given it that, that heading, that overarching theme because of the action words that Mark uses. We believe Mark uh, is the, the memoirs of Peter. And Peter was not so concerned under the uh, watch care of the Holy Spirit to, to give us genealogical information as he is to get us to the cross. And so we've been moving there immediately, then then and next. And we're getting closer and closer. We're, we find ourselves today uh, at Passover. Every month, for some time now, we celebrate on the first Sunday of the month the Lord's Supper. We tie it to a fellowship meal. And I've told you uh, more times than I can remember, and I hope that you will never forget that Jesus transformed Passover that night. Wasn't the first one he'd celebrated with them. Third or fourth by best chronological evidence. He transformed it from Passover into communion or the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, which is the, the term that we, we like to use here. Mark 14, verses 12 to 25. I want to ask you to stand with me if you would and follow along in your Bibles as I read. If you don't have a Bible, we're putting the text on the screen for you and would like to give you a Bible Get one to you at the end of the service if you don't have one. You need your own Bible. You need to see it for yourself. Gazing upon the Word. There's something very powerful about that. Follow along as I read these verses, please. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. He took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord take this today and press it to our minds and our hearts. And may we rejoice like perhaps we have not in a while in the amazing love God has shown for us in sending Jesus to live the perfect life, sinless, completely obedient to the law, die that substitutionary sacrificial death where he took upon himself our sin. He satisfied God's divine justice by his suffering and death in our place. And then rising from the grave three days later made that reality Grip us anew and afresh. And for some here today, grip you for the first time so that we live henceforth in a newness of life. Thank you. Be seated. We told you as we've been studying through this last portion of Mark that Jesus, after the scathing denunciation he pronounced upon the religious leaders where he pressed and pressed and now exposes them and calls them by name, left the temple never to return to the temple. He does return to Jerusalem, however, because you see part of Passover 
responsibilities was that the Passover had to be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. And so we're going to see this scene, this amazing time in the upper room. And I want you to feel what it must have been like. I want your heart to be gripped when he says, one of you will betray me. And I want you to see the Lamb of God who in that meal that night sets into anticipation the first time in history and the last time in history when the priest called upon by God to offer sacrifice is himself the sacrifice. I want you to see this passage this morning. We want to try to move through it in a timely way so we can we can act upon it and celebrate the Lord's Supper at the conclusion of the service. Three headings for you. There, there's this preparation of the Passover meal that we have in verses 12 to 16. Then there's, there's the announcement of the betrayal where, where Jesus, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, and then the institution of the Lord's Supper, the great transition, the great transformation, the great uh, bringing into reality, full focus, the new covenant being instituted. First of all, let's look at this preparation of the Passover meal. This, the first day of unleavened bread, so Passover is underway. I told you there will, be, there will be multitudes in Jerusalem who have traveled from all over the known world. Jews who, have, who live in places called, we talked about this in, in the Bible study time this morning, uh, and the dispersion, the, the diaspora. They, have, they come back, they make annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Those who, who make the uh, conscientious, uh, intentional plans, they would bring their own sacrifice with them. Those who not would get to the city and purchase uh, the sacrifice there. Of course, that's what prompted Jesus to, to cleanse the temple uh, because of the money changers making merchandise and, and uh, on a very holy, high and holy festival. So they're gathered to remember the great night when God delivered Israel from Egypt. So there's preparation that is made, and, and as our text tells us that uh, at this time of the year when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, the disciples said to him, so where would you have us go and prepare to eat the Passover? And he sends two of them, and he tells them what to do, go to the city, a man carrying a jar of water will, will meet you, follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat Passover with my disciples? So apparently Jesus has made uh, preparations ahead of time. So they go. They meet the man just as he had told them. He'll show them the place, the upper room. And they're there to make preparations for this. This Passover, it's fascinating if you read the history of how Passover was celebrated. You know it was instituted when, when Israel was in bondage to Egypt and we, this, God sent Moses to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Release them so they can go into the wilderness and worship me. When Karen and I were in Branson recently, we had the opportunity to see the uh, Moses... Uh, experience at the Sight and Sound Theater. Uh, very well done. Very impressive. Plague after plague after plague is sent as, Mo as Pharaoh hardens his heart. And the final plague, the ultimate act, where God, the true and living God, instructs his people to do a couple of things. Prepare Bread, prepare a meal, unleavened bread, bread made in a hurry, they called it. Because when he gave the signal, they were to leave immediately. And they were to paint, take the blood of a lamb and, and to paint that over their doorposts. Because the death angel was coming that night and would slay the firstborn in every household where there was not blood over the doorpost. I've told you before about the significance of this. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, was in the Egyptian mindset the, the, 
the physical representation of the sun god Ra, the, the most sovereign, most omnipotent god of all the pantheon of gods in Egypt. Pharaoh was the human representation of Ra. He could give life and take it according to Egyptian religious teachings. And when God came with the death angel that night through Egypt and slew the firstborn from every household, which is in that culture is a way of saying you have no future. Even the house of Pharaoh was not spared. And his heir had his life taken that night. And, and what you have there is this incredible picture where, where for the Egyptians, their ultimate God could do nothing in the face of the God of the Israelites. And that was the indication that they were to leave. And they, and they, they did leave. Uh, you remember the, Jew, the, 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 the Egyptians gave them things as they were leaving, I, I believe almost as tribute to, in, in hopes that they would not suffer further devastation. And they left Egypt and headed into the wilderness, uh, crossing the Red Sea. You know the story. And Passover was instituted because of that. In fact, it's called Passover because the death angel moved through taking life after life, but he passed over the home where there was blood painted on the, on the door posts. Powerful symbolism of what God does on behalf of sinners whose lives receive the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as atonement for our sins. So this has been celebrated now. And I want to give you just a couple of pictures here from the Passover. It was a time that was always marked by excitement. And it was filled with the high hope that as they remembered God's intervention in the past, that this time, this Passover would be the time when he intervened again, when Messiah would come to be the ultimate deliverer and deliver his people from, from all of the oppression of those who had them under bondage. So they called it a night of watching unto the Lord. They had this conviction that in that night that they were redeemed in the past and in that celebration of that night, they would be redeemed in the future. The meal was framed within a liturgy that had at its core the Passover prayer of the family head and the reciting of the Hallel Psalms, Psalm 113 through 118. The head of the house would seat the family and pronounce a blessing. First of the festival and then of the wine. And they would drink in the course of that meal four cups of wine. The food was brought in consisting of unleavened bread, bitter herbs, green, stewed fruit, and a roast lamb. The oldest son of the family was taught that in this high and holy celebration, he would be the one at the right time who would ask, what do these things mean, Father? And they would recite the story I just told you. And they would praise God along these terms. So may the Lord, our God, and the God of our fathers cause us to enjoy the feasts that come in peace, glad of heart at the upbuilding of your city and rejoicing in your service. And we shall thank you with a new song for our redemption. The head of the house would take the bread, pronounce a blessing over it thusly. The Lord our God, sovereign of the world, who has caused bread to come forth out of the earth, we bless you. This was how the, the meal would unfold. In Mark's account, he focuses his attention upon two incidents in the course of this evening 
celebration, the moment of the dipping of the bread and the bitter herbs in the bowl, the bowl of stewed fruit, when Jesus speaks of betrayal, and the interpretation of the bread and the third cup of the wine following the meal. So let's look at this. There they are. The twelve are gathered with Jesus in the upper room. They're reclining at table. And children, you would need to know this. They, they did not sit in chairs as you and I do when we come to, to sit at our meal. I have some grandchildren that don't, don't think a chair is made to sit in. They, they kneel in it. They kind of squirm around. They'll, they'll sit on the edge of it and hang off. So you might feel really good at reclining. I don't know. They would recline around a table. And Jesus says something. Remember, this is not the first time they've celebrated Passover with him. He says something that had to rock them to their core. Truly. And I've told you before, that's, a, that's a, amen in the Greek. It's a, the loose paraphrase is listen up, pay attention. I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. We were looking at this same passage in, in John's Gospel last Sunday evening as we're studying through the uh, how to be disciple makers following Jesus day by day. In the account John gives us, they want to know who it is, and Jesus says, he who dips with me, and he offers it to Judas. We're not given those details here in Mark. But they're sorrowful when they hear the, the idea. You see, up until this time, brothers and sisters, he has said that the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, handed over to the, to the religious leaders, ultimately executed, and will rise again. And they, they have a hard time taking that in. They're not, they're not embracing that. In fact, I told you last week that, that it's the woman who comes in and anoints his head and anoints his feet. She understood. She prepared me for my burial, Jesus said. The disciples basically did not want to hear of it. They, they wanted to put it out of sight, out of mind. They, they were dull to it. So he's been telling them this, and now it gets more personal. One of you will be the betrayer. Not just that I'll be betrayed, because when he said that, it'd be easy for them to think, well, the the, the the priest and the scribes, the Sanhedrin, they'll, they'll come up with a plot if it happens at all and, and somehow trick him up. One of you. And they respond as you would expect anyone. Is, is it I, Lord? And the question is not asked in such a way that there's a confession going here. It's like you could render it, Lord, it's, it's, not, it's not me, is it? Surely not me. In fact, Peter the, will speak in other gospel accounts. Well, others may, but I'll, I'll never. Not me. He says to them again, and notice the emphasis here. It is one of the twelve. So notice he's, he's gone from one of you, one who's eating with me, some, someone in this room, one of the twelve. Not because there were more than twelve in the room, because he wants to know one of, one of you who has been with me for three, three and a half years. Who is dipping bread into the dish with me. And then he sets the whole tragic episode in context, in prophetic context. For the Son of Man goes as it, in the, to get a grip on the, on the verb tense, as it has been written of him. In other words, it's already been prophesied. We told you before that in this, in this movement of verb tenses, the, the force of this is as it was written long ago and it still stands true. He is going to be betrayed. It's been prophesied. Well, you take that and you think, well, then who would find fault? If, if it's inevitable, if it's prophesied, I mean, how can you possibly blame a person for simply being a part of the fulfillment of prophecy? I've, I've taught you before that there's a tension that you dare not let go of. It is the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. 
and you hold it just like this, and, and to let one or the other go puts you in a ditch that you don't want to be in. One is if you go with the sovereignty of God, then well, case sera, sera, whatever will be will be, when no one's responsible. No, that's wrong. If you go the other way, well then, then surely man can change this. Tension, bro. Tension. What J.I. Packer calls a divine antinomy. The Son of Man goes as it has been written. God has sovereignly decreed it. And woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Woe upon him. Peter did the same thing preaching at Pentecost. A uh, good uh, month and a half, almost two months later, when he would say, Jesus, who was set before you by the decree and foreknowledge of God, you with wicked hands put to death. It's the same thing. God sovereignly decreed it and determined it, and the person who engages in it is absolutely responsible and accountable to God. And he says this, it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And Jesus has used this imagery before. It's better for a person to have a millstone tied around his neck and thrown into the sea than for him to live one day where he have the opportunity to offend these little ones. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Brothers and sisters, these are piercing words in a setting that should have been a high, holy, happy, festive time to remember God's great deliverance. And Jesus is speaking about being delivered over to be betrayed. He announces the inevitable betrayal. We know from reading John, studying John last Sunday night, that when Judas dips in the cup with Jesus, Jesus looks at him says, that which you must do, do quickly. And he leaves the room, and then we'll, we're going to look tonight again and, and, at how Jesus taught things when Judas left the room that, that he'd never taught them before. The 11 who remained, who were going to carry forth the mission. Never been born. Now think about the impact of that. Brothers and sisters, don't waste your life. Do not let it be said of you when you come to the end of your days, it would have been better if you had never been born. So we have Passover. And Jesus takes this. And we'll use, we believe, use language they've been familiar with, but he transforms it into the Lord's Supper. This institution of the Lord's Supper in verses 22 to 25. As they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. The language there, for many, we remember that from Mark 10, 45. Son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When Jesus lifted up the platter of unleavened bread, we can, we can assume with good historical context that he probably spoke the Aramaic formula which prescribed the liturgy, something like this. This is the bread of affliction which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let everyone who hungers come and eat. Let everyone who is needy come and eat the Passover meal. He would have recited the blessing that I read earlier. Praised be thou, O Lord, sovereign of the world, who causes bread to come forth from the earth. And the people in the room would respond, Amen. But he does something different. In the midst of the things with which they were familiar in the celebration of Passover, he says, I am this bread. 
And I have no doubt in my mind when he said that, that their minds went back to what we read from John chapter 6. The bread of life discourse, which was, was very offensive to the people who heard it. One of the largest crowds that ever gathered to hear him speak, turned away and walked away. And remember at the end of John chapter 6, Jesus looks at the disciples and says, Are you going to go away as well? Peter said, Lord, where would we go? Only you have the words of life. So you come to a time in your life where you where you're you're gonna the crowd is gonna sweep you up. We're there, brothers and sisters. We live in a day in a culture that is demanding that we embrace an agenda that makes the scripture null and void. And we have to answer the question, will we also go away? And we need to be able to say, Lord, where would we go? Look, you take this book away from me, I've got nothing. I know nothing valuable at all. You alone have the words of life. And so he says this, this bread is my body. Take and eat. This is my body. You see in the Passover celebration, the head of the house at this point in the meal would have said, Speak praises to our God to whom belongs what we have eaten. Praised be our God for the food we have eaten. Take. This is my body. Then he moves to the cup, and one commentator made the observation, this is the third cup. It's the cup that emphasized redemption. And words would have been spoken at this point in the meal, may the all-merciful one Make us worthy of the days of the Messiah and of the life of the world to come. He brings the salvation of his king. He shows covenant faithfulness to his anointed, to David, to his seed forever. He makes peace in his heavenly places. May he secure peace for us and for all Israel. And the people would respond, Amen. And Jesus says, this cup. This third cup, this cup which would remind you of the redemption from Egypt. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I agree. I, I've already said this before. I don't think that this was sinking in at this point, but I promise you, hours later, hours later, it would begin to sink in with great pain and misery. Their minds might have gone back to John chapter 6 where they struggled with whether or not Jesus was teaching cannibalism or what was going on there and it had to be more than that. And now they're seeing him make the connection that the elements of Passover were always and only designed to anticipate him. A loaf broken and shared, would anticipate him, his life, his body broken, beaten, brutally, beyond recognition. But done so, so that his life, the significance of his life, could be shared. That's what we do today. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, we're saying we share in this broken life. When he died, he died for me. This cup, which would remind us that God redeemed Israel out of Egypt. This cup is the testimony that Jesus shed his blood and redeemed us, the new Israel, the spiritual children of Abraham who become so by grace through faith in Christ, the circumcision of the heart that is regeneration, the new birth. 
And they didn't get it that night. But I think they were staggered and stupefied by what he had to say. And every time we celebrate this month in and month out, that's what's going on. We don't have to experience the, the transition and transformation from Passover to Lord's Supper because you see, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. And we come to celebrate the new covenant. The promise of God to Ezekiel and Jeremiah that the everlasting covenant would come into play when Jesus Christ shed his blood. And in the new covenant, the hope is that God will write his law upon your heart. He's done that for those of you who are saved. He will do that for any who will be saved. That he will take away the heart of stone, the stony heart that, that plays religion and, and would rather have your way than God's way. He'll take that heart away and give you a heart of flesh that, that beats for him, loves him, longs to live for him. A heart that is grieved when sin is discovered in our lives. The new covenant, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then he makes this amazing promise that I cannot take in. <laughs> he says, I won't do this again until I do this with you. I won't do this again. You see, he's in heavenly session right now at the right hand of the Father having accomplished redemption. Seeing redemption applied by the Spirit. There he is. And he's denying himself still. He, his whole life was one of self-denial. And he denies himself still in heaven, refusing to engage in something like this until you and I and all of his elect, all of those for whom he died, have been gathered to be with him in the great marriage supper of the Lamb. So we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper now. Men, would you come?